This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, I'm back with more RPGs, dice, 3D printing, and all that kind of cool stuff. Remember, if you like, share, and subscribe, the channel will grow. If you subscribe and hit the notification, you won't miss anything whenever I come out. And if you keep following me, you won't miss anything that's not a scam because uh, we capture everything, right? Every single week. And there was so much last week that we had to do three episodes. This time, squeezed right under when I had to do the cutoff to uh, fill out the episode. So, uh, yeah, it's starting to back up a little bit for August already. It's not even July, <laughs> but uh, that's just how things go. Um, we'll catch up as quickly as we can and go from there. There were a couple of um, campaigns that ended last week, that just started last week. I'm sure it's because they wanted to modify their expectations to something a little more realistic. And uh, it's just one of the things. So if you see a repeat, that's what that's about. Otherwise, let's get to it. And straight from Ho Chi Minh City, we have the Creature Feature Quarterly Volume 1 for Mark Borg. This is 16 creatures that Jeremy Hart Elos or Elosh, however he wants to pronounce it, has created this time in zine format that allows you to use a lot of the creatures he's been uh, illustrating for various RPGs for the last 17 plus years, however long it's been. So a guy that you've probably seen the artwork for in other uh, types of games, he doesn't really have it advertised which games those are, but it's kind of neat. It comes with a VTT token of a Cthuloid. Uh, you could turn it into the big... Uh, you know, Dark Evil himself, because he's the squid dragon. Um, or you can make it a standee cut out of paper. There's like a shadow side and then a front and back side. So you do a flip and then uh, you can make like a three area or three sided object uh, with a back side that's shaded. Um, that works pretty well. Uh, anything that you're looking for, for more board, if you need more creatures, this is a game that has been expanding ridiculously over the last year people seem to be enjoying it and if you want some of these classic rpg characters done over in the mork work style this is an opportunity to get that then we have the hunt for the lichens models and this is actually misfiled it should have been under tabletop games but it's not it's just under the regular games category they should not do that <laughs> that is some beginner type stuff that's a problem and they've got three uh, other campaigns uh, from Lambo Simon, Simon or Simon Lambo, however they want to pronounce their name, uh, Simon Miniatures, Simon Miniatures. They're from France, so I don't know how they would pronounce it themselves. But they're really nice sculpts of, of the lichen, which is the werewolf, and then you have a couple of the huntsman types that would be going around. There is a German myth about the werewolf. It's one of the older werewolf myths. I think it goes back to the 1600s or possibly before. And this is evocative of that where the wolf man is out in the woods uh, out there and the, the people either hire some axemen or woodsmen or the people that do the cutting down of timber have to go out with whatever tools they've got and hunt them themselves. So in those days, people would be hunting pretty regularly. So having spears and whatnot isn't that big a deal. They also have some druidic uh, kinds of uh, nature gods, which is what that Bragan looks like with his big old antler horns and whatnot. Um, if you like that kind of diorama, you like that kind of setup, then these are great models for that. Then if you want to make your own Les Miserables, then you need some stuff from the French Revolutions. This is Emigre at the Battle of Quiberon, 1795-28mm metal models. So you can see they're metal and they've got the little wax bits on them uh, that are ready to be cast. There's a pretty large army. I don't know how to pronounce them all, uh, but if you're into this era of wargaming where they have single shot pistols, um, they're still having some of the older like uh, spikes and spears and that kind of thing and bayonets, then uh, this is probably something to interest you. I think you probably could use a lot of these for even American Revolutionary War considering how there was some equipment brought over from the French. Um, or even uh, War of 1812, there's so probably some overlap between there. Uh, whatever it is you're looking for, uh, if you want it for an RPG, if you want it for a war game, they got your minis. All the same things, but up for a couple generations, about 100 years later, out in the Old West itself, Boots and Saddles, the Western Range. So you got cowboys, you got Union soldiers. Um, I don't, I mean, you can paint them gray if you wanted to, but if you're going to play Deadlands, if you're going to play 
the Blazing Saddles game. When I went to my first gaming convention here in LA, there were more tables devoted to Blazing Saddles miniatures games than any other game. Malifaux, whatever it is that you want to play, if you're going to use these as proxies, um, there you go. There's a lot of rain, Rough Rider type uh, characters. There are a few Native Americans. And then the type of folks that you would see coming out of Tombstone, the movie. Uh, so if you want any kind of cowboy or any uh, of that era, not necessarily just cowboy, then maybe these will be good ones for you. Like I say, perfect for Deadlands. And then back on Morkborg, we have Temple of the Kraken God. And here's the thing about Krakens, especially in D&D, they are more corrupt the older they get. They have different types of influence. That's why they can be one of the warlock patrons. Um, and it's kind of carried over here into Morkborg with a mechanic called corruption. So as you get closer to this island where the Kraken lives, the more corruption you're going to take on the longer you're there, almost like you're radioactive. And also dark artifacts that have been changed by that corruption. So those are interesting ideas. It is a dark, terrible world in the middle of its own apocalypse. So that kind of stuff fits pretty well. There's uh, ships as part of it because they are obviously uh, an island and you got to get there. As you can see, there's things like the giant jellyfish and other shipbound things that can happen to, uh, along there. And yeah, more of your heavy metal nightmares. Then for those of you that are painters, maybe that you're kind of new and you got a sprawling collection that I always end up in that situation. <laughs> This is some paint accessories that you can 3D print off yourself. They're made to hold the various sizes of paint pots, be it from Army Painter, Citadel, uh, P3, whatever it is that you've got. You can change the sizes if you need to. And there's also a 3D printable paint shaker that works off of a handle. So um, you can turn the handle just like it was a cheese grinder and then it'll shake your paint. I have a robot, robot paint shaker thing that uh, cost me, I don't know, 80, 90 bucks. And it is worth every penny. Um, it just works perfectly and does everything. But if I had to do a bigger piece, like a big old tub of uh, epoxy or something like that, or uh, resins, or uh, even um, some primers, they come in the bigger bottles, then uh, having something else that I could hand crank might be a little more horsepower for that application, in which case this would be pretty usable. If you need a 3D printer, the Anycubic Viper is coming out at the end of the month and it has auto leveling and that is my killer app, auto leveling, because that is all the headaches gone. All you got to do from there is just make sure that your filament is good and that you got the right temperatures. So if you're into that, I would support the Anycubic Viper because I bought one and I'm waiting on it to be delivered and I might actually sign up and get this as well, um, just considering how my paint collections just continue to grow nonstop. And I do not know why these guys are called Tag, but their Gobudai, Riders of the Shimmering Horde, are a goblin warg set. As you can see, wargs are very wolf-like creatures you find in Tolkien. And uh, the goblins you can stick on top. These guys are blue, you can paint them whatever color you want. That's up to you. They're your goblins. They have a bunch of different action poses. And I think they come in separate pieces for the rider and the, uh, the wolf warg thing. Um, so depending on what you need, you might be able to adjust them. They will obviously be metal. As you can see, they're done in the green wax. That means they're going to be done in metal when they finally make it to you. And dust in time for the 4K release of Howard the Duck on uh, UHD Blu-ray. We have more Ducks of Glorantha. And these are duck-based RPG <laughs> ideas, if uh, that's your world. Um, I don't know if there's any rules changes that need to be made for ducks. If they hold their breath longer, if they're more buoyant... Uh, if they like bread, who knows what the changes are. Somebody who plays this game RuneQuest will probably be able to say so. Um, I mean, I have no problem with it. It's fine. It's interesting. There are some characters in there, such as Lunar Priestesses, Shaman, Minotaur, and uh, Trolls and whatnot that are not. Uh, there's something called a Woctopus, which is a walking octopus. Great idea. Um, that they're not ducks, so you don't exclusively have to be looking for ducks. There's also some pretty neat looking terrain, as you can see there in the bottom left. Whatever it is you're looking for, if you're into these kind of minis, then tell me why. <laughs> and uh, if you need some other terrain like huts and things, give it a look, because you can buy those separately if that's what you need too. And then kind of like the opposite of Van Richten's guide, this is Thimmon's guide to gods and miracles. So Van Richten's would show you how to become corrupted 
by the Feywild or um, a vampire or be brought back to life uh, as a construct, basically. This is you get turned into an angel or there is a summoner class. It's how to use various gods for various reasons and how to use angels and stuff. It is a zine, so it's a little bit of advice, but uh, you know, it's not exactly the um, most expensive thing in the world to help you out. Five bucks will get you a way in to, to see if any of these ideas are great. Um, black and white artwork, obviously zines are not necessarily known for spending a lot of money on art, but that doesn't mean they're not extremely effective uh, at getting the point across, which is their point in the first place. Um, so the new summoner class, there's not a lot of information, uh, as to what that is, but maybe if you were interested, you can ask them and uh, get some more going on. I don't know if it means you summon angels or if it's just like a ranger class that is like the beast master where you summon stuff to your aid, like you're playing magic, the gathering, but for reals. Then for the 3d printing fans, we've got Northern ogres. So a lot of different versions of these guys. Um, they have various banners and various uh, groups, so it's not just people. Although you can use the same poses uh, with axes and whatnot, uh, some of them will have musical instruments like horns that they can play, uh, extra uh, pieces of armor to show off their um, value to the society. Some of them don't look like what you would expect with uh, regular ogres, considering how they have different hairstyles and things. They might look like uh, giants, so. Uh, don't discount them just because it says Ogre. Take a quick look at all the different uh, sculpts because there are quite a few of them. And they might be useful in various uh, uses, including some that hold like uh, cannons, like full cannons uh, holding onto them themselves. Um, there is, like I keep saying, that there's a bunch of musician types, but even the musicians have weapons on them. So, uh, I don't know, maybe they, they shoot in... Uh, formation or they shoot in some type of rhythm. Uh, there's also the bannermen which ride around on giant hogs which is an interesting concept. That brings their scale down so maybe even if you wanted something that was more scaled to like the the hog riders in uh, the last Hobbit movies with the big war. Uh, Billy Connolly's uh, characters are riding around the hogs. Maybe you'd want those for this as well. And then if you've got a VTT, this is the uh, RPG world map creation kit. So uh, if you need help, a lot of these are in black and white that you can just drop onto a blank map or something that has a couple different textures to help create little features, uh, mines, fists, uh, big old held mouths, whatever it is that you might uh, feel that you need to give your uh, map a little extra flavor. And you can either cut these out from printing and set it on your map, or you can use them as PNGs onto your virtual tabletop. Whatever it is that you think you need, you can even color them in if you feel the need to do that. And talking about dwarves, now we have space dwarves. These are uh, different units. It's been very popular popping up uh, all over different sets, different games. People like space dwarves. Apparently each one of these guys has their own personality. They have their own weapons and different things, including some type of weird vibro connected axes and halberds and whatnot. All that kind of stuff is neat. There's even some type of uh, Gandalf G4 NDF character, which is the cyborg wizard, and uh, Bill Joe and Bill, the P O N E bot um, pony. Yeah, it, it's it, it's fun. If you like the Hobbit, you want it in space. Here's a good place to start. And we started the episode with the Napoleonic Wars and French Revolution and all that, and we're back at it. So this time you got artillery. If you picked up the first. Uh, characters this time you can get those ones were in metal this time these are uh, set up to be printed in resin so if you have an MSLA printer then that's the way to go with these there's a lot of round objects and little tiny shapes and spindles and things so FDM isn't as suggested unless you want to do a lot more piecing it together yourself um, but yeah some big old guns some big old artillery and uh, cannons set them up however you like you can even get artilleryman figures added on as well if uh, you're concerned at all about how it would look with the stuff you already have there are some renders and you can check it out but otherwise there's cannons check it out and then i think this is probably not named correctly as a dice puzzle it's dice it is metal dice pounded out in from a sheet and uh, through whatever system that they use 
print, they paint on various colors. So you can see uh, rainbow colors to red, green, whatever. Uh, as long as I don't, I don't know what uh, the finish they're going to have on them, but I would say probably stay away from things like brake cleaner, and you're probably all right. Uh, anything that's got, uh, um, I don't know, alcohol would probably not be a good idea if you went to clean these. They are thicker than the previous releases that they've come out with on these sheets of uh, dice that you can assemble yourself. But basically, you're going to bend it up and set it up with tabs. This is not going to be perfectly refined like you would find with the much more expensive uh, metal dice that are out there. But you'll have the game set version of it to, or the, the aspect of holding it yourself a little bit like origami. I hope that it only bends on the tabs. Uh, being hollow like this, obviously, it's going to be very lightweight. It's going to fling around, and if you did step on it, it's not going to have a whole lot of strength, um, depending on what it gets uh, knocked into. So just keep that in mind. It's more of like a, a fun exercise than it is an accurate uh, polyhedral dice system. And then we have Crazy Mushrooms V2.0. These are STL files for you to print off with lots of different underdark-looking creations, lots of goblins, there's even like a rideable crab thing that looks pretty cool. There are some mushrooms themselves, just like a mushroom, here you go, uh, but a lot of them look like goblins and uh, and orcs and other crazy things that are in there and other just underdweller troglodyte uh, individuals. Uh, lots of personality, very interesting looking characters, and you can get the 1.0 pack to go with it. Uh, there's also some bases for uh, you know, the dirt and the mushrooms and that kind of stuff that you might find down there. So if you're going to run an Underdark campaign, I say give these guys a look and maybe you'll utilize the bases, maybe you'll utilize the characters. There's all kinds of good reasons why you might enjoy it because they are pretty well sculpted. And then if you need a particular type of equipment that you probably haven't thought of yet, a mask might be for you. They're not just for the uh, doctors, the plague doctor types. Um, they can be used to show off your affinity with a god. They can show off all kinds of weird things, some enemy that you took down. Uh, and it's not just a matter of a helmet. Um, they can show off a lot more. And that could be part of your power. So here we go with uh, a whole book full of ideas of ways that you can attune to uh, various aspects, pumpkin heads, uh, foxes from Asian uh, iconography, dragons all that kind of fun stuff. So if you're into it, there's a couple different uh, archetypes such as uh, the Masked Hunter is one of them that they're adding in for a total of 12 new archetypes. There's a few unique powers depending on uh, what type of mask you wear, what kind of creature it's from, all that kind of stuff that you can get. And uh, why not? So you also have legendary creatures that you could hunt down in order to make masks from them. So there's a, a good variety of story hooks, good variety of things that can make your characters interesting. Uh, obviously though, as you can see, there's that Japanese theming with the fox creatures and all that from the, the cover. It carries out in, uh, to various other parts of uh, the book. Swinging back over to sci-fi, we have open lock modular sci-fi tiles. Uh, Chris Martins has come out with stuff before. And yeah, you can use them for whatever type of campaign that you think is great, Starfinder or Stargrave or any other game that you might need. Also, think about it. Maybe you have a society that is like Numenera where there is a previous um, uh, civilization and there's some ancient technologies you can run into. You could have a ruined area, cover it in snot and have it be a xenomorph area. Whatever you want to do, there's some open lock tiles for you that you will allow you compatibility with a ton of other pieces of content. You make whatever it is that you think you need. Then if you got a person missing or you want to bring some new person into the game and you want to dip your toe into a different kind of narrative uh, before you get back into the main one just to see how they'd fit, play a side quest. Here's side quest five, a fifth collection of more cool stuff. So if you want to uh, pick some up from uh, Dominic here, then uh, you can get the other books as well to go along with it. Um, cool artwork, it's got maps, it's got everything that you need, uh, even this train, the train between the planes, so if something is anachronistic, it came from uh, another world possibly, uh, and dumped into yours, that's a reason why it could be interrupting your current quest, is because you have to investigate it, because it's super weird, 
lots of different ideas um, uh, available for you if you want to check them out. And you can pick up any of the other modules that you think you need as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's great to have uh, some maps and evocative artwork to go along with it. They spent a lot of good time and put their money in good places uh, to make it interesting for the buyer. Then this title of Dusting Dreams is a little uh, off-putting, maybe? Sand and dust are not the same kind of things, um, but it's supposed to be ancient Egyptian. So I think if they had said something about sand, then it would have been a little easier to connect the name with what you saw uh, there. So yeah, it just kind of throws you off. If you want to play through the never ending story, if you want to play through uh, an Egyptian campaign with mummies, if you want to do any of that kind of cool stuff, some Stargate kind of work, then there's a lot of cool things here for you to pick up various um, characters, various uh, sculptures, various buildings, and even some free models if you wanted to check any of them out. Different kind of terrain, different kind of world. This is our resin casted car terrain, super scale street cars. So you can get cop cars, you can get uh, minivans, you can get a lot of different ones. They have uh, all of the Marvel characters. I think it's uh, Crisis Protocol is the game as their examples, but you don't have to use it necessarily for that. You can use it for a lot of different um, games. You can use it for Brook City in board games. You can use it for whatever it is that you want to do. Um, even just uh, having wrecked cars, it's got a few of those. If you need them for Gaslands, then these are some interesting characters or cars to go along as well. But since they're resin, the wheels do not turn, so just keep that in mind. Then we have Copernia. They say it's a 5e campaign, 40 years in the making. Um, that's nice. The thing of it is, is they're asking for $162,000 on a first created um, deal. Uh, it's nice that you have artwork. Um, the artwork is, you know, top notch as you can see there from the left but there's not a lot of information as to what comes in the book and I mean while enough people uh, might look at this um, it's falling in the range of a typical D&D release which right now is probably looking to be ten or fifteen thousand dollars which is about ten percent of their ask I think people need to have a real solid <laughs> concept of what the market really supports if you can't bring a book down to maybe five thousand dollars as your initial uh ask then you really need to redo your numbers uh and build up higher um the uh esper who has hundreds of thousands of followers or whatever uh, the amount is he's been doing youtubes for uh longer than anyone on dnd uh, stuff even he didn't have a huge number of people um so it, even if you have built-in audience, people are asking, especially right now, ridiculous sums to get these things made. And we'll see it again, I guess. Someone who followed that philosophy of business is Defiant RPG. They were only asking for 15. They're already at 30. And they have a provocative concept. This is like Vampire the Masquerade, but angels and demons. This is something people can quickly jump on. It's interesting. You have that almost photorealistic art. I'm not sure if they um, did rotoscope on top of it or how they produced it, but the art looks really awesome. It's very similar to what you get from uh, Vampire the Masquerade. So people that are already playing uh, supernatural games that are similar might even be able to, to bring it together in some capacity. Um, there's Devas, Infernals, Angels, Leviathans. There's a plane going over when I'm trying to do a voiceover, but my voice is scratchy, so I'm not going to redo the voiceover. Um, all kinds of things that you can find out in this. It is doing pretty well. I think you should take a look at it. And actually, it might have been a front page. Uh, no, they didn't quite make it into the uh, projects we love, but I think it was doing pretty well on like, Kotaku's front page or one of the other ones. Um, if you like Vampire, you like the world, I keep bringing it up because it does feel so much like World of Darkness, like it needs to be there, it needs to fit right in. Aristocracy of angels and demons, fallen to earth, dragons and ancient gods, just like there would have been an aristocracy with vampires, I think it's a natural fit. Then we add a little bit of gambling to your dice. Um, these come in black bags, this is fortune dice, and you can get various polyhedrals, but you don't know which one you're getting. 
so it is a random game of what you're going to pick up. You can check it out and see what type of uh, fortune you may receive because I think they also come with fortune cookie fortunes tossed into them that are uh, related to RPG stuff. You can use them as different rules, that kind of thing. I guess if you just needed some random dice, then uh, this is an interesting way to go about it. And um, if you feel lucky, if they could be your lucky dice, then uh, even better. Then with an art style somewhere between the future and graffiti, lawman, RPG, bounty hunters, and shooting people for money. That's uh, pretty much it. <laughs> there you go. You're going to be flying around sectors, so it's like you're a lawman of the future. Um, as you can see with the guy on the bottom left, you know he's got his gas mask and he's got all his guns and all that kind of stuff. So it's not like it's an Old West thing, but you can set it up however you think you need to be. Um, it's got a little bit of parody that is attached to it that uh, is involved with the Cowboy Bebop and Robocop and Judge Dredd and Idiocracy and all that kind of stuff rolled in together. You have uh, Bullet Mancers and Thing Fixers as archetypes. So those would be your healer and your, um, I guess a Bullet Mancer would be uh, close to a mage. Um, the system is called Critical Failure 20. Uh, it runs off of a target, and then you roll, I guess, a d20. Um, simplified system. Basically, if you got a robot, if you got a hacker, if you got whatever you need, you go out there into the cyberspace, you go out there into the real space, planet to planet, shoot stuff up and be a Lobo of your own. Find some space dolphins if you want to. And if you need some models for this kind of thing, Mercy's Reach might be able to help you out. These are universal models you can put with any game that you want. Some of them are cyberpunk, some of them are like Warhammer style. You can use some of them in fantasy. Uh, just have to take a look and look at the various uh, versions that they come out with. This has been, um, I think, what's going to happen on a lot of new games. You're going to have books from people like uh, Tabletop Minions. They just came out with the system agnostic or uh, models agnostic system. And um, then you had the fantasy series from Blacklist separate from their Lasting Tales uh, game that was system agnostic. And I think you're going to end up with a lot of lines of uh, sculpts like this that you can just print off yourself to get over the next year or two when uh, plastics are going to be harder to come by and more expensive because they're coming from China because you can't um, just have another infrastructure put in for all the plastics, but you can easily do that with the paper uh, products that come in the games. So if you start getting in on this now, that might set you up for the future. You have yourself a nice painted uh, army or whatever the game requires. If uh, you find one that you particularly like, then you'll be able to jump on those type of games. But right now, this isn't a game, it's just the models. Maybe at the least, you get some practice painting. Then we have Modular Realms, the Masters of the Waterways. This is magnetic tile that packs flat, and uh, that allows you to have whatever type of terrain you need. Um, it snaps together real fast, so if you did want to do a Fog of War in 3D, then uh, within a few seconds you can put the pieces together uh, if you know what you need. Make a plan first, but then uh, set the pieces aside, uh, and you can grab like little baggies and just build out the game as you go. They have asked for a hundred grand though. I am not shocked because with you, this type of manufacturing, they probably actually require it uh, in order to get the pieces made, sculpted, all that kind of stuff. There's just a lot of pieces that have to go and it's all made out of plastic, which means it's all gonna be done in China and the prices on everything in China right now are quadrupled. So I'm not shocked that it's that much but uh, I wouldn't also be shocked if it didn't make it and eventually they offered a 3D printable version um, that was just licensed out so that you can make your own if you think you needed to do that. Uh, yeah, it's the fate of the world. They made some really bad decisions in uh, logistics, not this company, but the people out in China who run the shipping companies and uh, the Communist Party itself uh, not allowing them to use our Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. Um, has led to labor shortages, and that's why we're screwed. Then we got a new RPG. This is Other Worlds, and it's kind of like Sliders, where you're going to be running to a bunch of different um, weird worlds. So far, there's 12 to get to, but I'm sure you can add your own if you think you need to. Different puzzles, different ideas. 
uh, like Sliders uh, or Exiles, whatever thing that you watched or read, um, you have a bunch of uh, weird worlds that are out there, and this allows you to explore a new one whenever you're tired of the old one. So I like that idea. The only thing I don't like is that the symbol or the object that they use is called a Wanderer, and a Wanderer is someone that can take an action, and this is not something that can take an action. It is an object. Uh, I think if it were a wander, or if it were something else named that way, just not an er, uh, then uh, it would be less difficult for me to form my mouth around it as that concept because it's like, it's like it just feels wrong. But hey, maybe you don't have that problem. You weren't an English teacher, maybe. And then I really hope that isn't Bill Burr just wandering around my house in a damn helicopter because it's June and everything's open and he tended to do that the year before last. Hopefully they don't keep interrupting my voiceovers. You see what's on the screen. They're retro dice. They have digital digits as uh, the way that the numerals are represented and some of them glow in the dark. Uh, if you're into that kind of thing, it is pretty visible. Uh, may be hard to tell the difference between sixes and nines. Um, I don't really see too many of them on the screen there. Uh, tell, oh, there's a little dot to tell you. So that part is fine. So if you want something that looks like an alarm clock, there you go, you got dice. And they come in hot pink and uh, different neon colors to make it look really uh, futuristic if uh, you're playing a futuristic campaign like Cyberpunk. Yeah, I keep having to start and stop the voiceovers because it literally is Bill Burr flying around his helicopter because he's the only one in a... He'll be on a podcast next week talking about how much he loved flying his helicopter around Long Beach. If anyone wants to tell him, like, go somewhere else. Go to San Pedro <laughs> and stop getting away with my voiceovers. Anyway, uh, Adventures of Oz, we go even further old school. This is a 5th edition version, so you can take all of the wacky things, including flying monkeys if you want to be one, and play it out. You don't even have to tell your players that that's the world that they end up in. You can just end up with like a Leonid and uh, happens to be cowardly. <laughs> you can get the winged monkeys and munchkins and uh, other crazy things just popping up and let them be revealed. Uh, even the Stephen King Dark Tower series took some stuff like the Emerald City into a very dark direction. And uh, 500 pages here uh, made just right for you to be able to use all of the different goose goblins and hippographs and imp folk and whatever crazy things that are created. Um, even these uh, giant turtles uh, that people run around on. Um, different types of NPCs like the ones you would find in the Emerald City. You can utilize it all. You can make it all work. You can make your own world. Uh, it's from Rob Kuntz, which is a member of the old TSR uh, game design stuff. I'm not sure what he worked on necessarily. Oh, it says here, Deities and Demigods, which is one of the more famous AD&D modules uh, that came out. Um, so that part is pretty cool. And uh, he's part of this, I guess, writing in, uh, in the uh, forward. There's even a deck of many things that is Oz-based. So I think there's a lot you can pick up if you want uh, to check it out if you're a big fan of the original works. I think it's a Silver City instead of Emerald City in the original one. Or they're Silver Slippers instead of Ruby Slippers. I think that's what it is. Um, but there's so much violence. There's so many warring factions and everything like that. I think you should check it out. If Even if you're not a fan of the movie, don't worry about the movie. There's a huge world that is not represented in just the movie. And if this looks familiar, it's because it was on last week's episode, I think, or the week before. This is Scrap Runs. And I guess they had a target that was set too high, then they restarted, and now that they've actually passed, like I say, you don't have to create this pie-in-the-sky uh, $100,000 or whatever crazy amount of money. Uh, thing is, uh, at the beginning, just get the damn thing made. Most people don't make a profit on these Kickstarters. It's very rare that actually happens. Uh, but it allows them to, to get it made, get the tooling made, and then they can make more money from the popularity of the Kickstarter later by selling the product at a higher price and getting into retail, that kind of stuff. So um, it's good that these guys have uh, taken that uh, tactic very quickly so that they can get into people's hands. These are full metal, uh, futuristic orcs, goblins, that kind of stuff. So if you had space dwarves, now you got to fight them against space goblins. You're all set. If you're going to run Shadowrun, if you're going to run Warhammer, you're going to run whatever it is that you want to run, 
then uh, these guys might be useful in those capacities. Then I, we have a redesign of a game from four or five years ago. This is Synthesize Shapers in the Dark run on Forged in the Dark. So I'm not sure what the game had a few years ago, but I, I think the redesigned part of it is that it's moved into the Forged in the Dark system. You're going to be playing some uh, spacefaring criminals that are out there called Shapers and uh, doing everything you can in a world where human life means nothing. And yeah, so that's it. Uh, go out there, run some heists in space. This comes with uh, five spaceship sheets, 15 planets, 17 factions, uh, six bio classes, so you can change how the mechanics and mutations are, are set up, and five different crews that you can uh, create, and seven playbooks. So yeah, there's quite a bit of content available if you're into this kind of thing. I'm going to guess it's more combat heavy than something like Traveler. Then we have an adventure that comes with a miniature. This is Neradul the Infamous Celestial. And uh, it's a 32mm uh, miniature that comes along with both uh, of the wing sets. Are, you can remove them. So it goes to a total of 48mm tall. And you get the stat blocks and all that kind of cool stuff. It's provided as an STL. It's not a physical object, so you do have to have a printer to go along with it. But that's a cool thing to add on. So not only do you have the big bad, you get the book, you get all the stuff, you get the miniature ready to play with you already. There you are. The module is five to eight characters, uh, is what it's set up for. And it's supposed to take a character that group of five to eight through level 10. Uh, maybe it'll take you a little longer, get a higher level if you have less. That part's up to you. Um, you can introduce the Kingdom of Lothmar into whatever medieval campaign that you want. This is both for Pathfinder 1st uh, Edition and 5e. Maybe they just didn't test it for 2nd Edition, or maybe because uh, Pathfinder 1st Edition is based on AD&D, and the 2nd Edition is that uh, action system. Uh, maybe it's just balanced a little bit different, and they didn't have a chance to test it. Couldn't tell you, haven't played it myself, but maybe there's some conversion tools if you are playing 2nd Edition. So it's no secret that the main parts of a story are basically formulaic. And that's what you're provided with here. 60 tarot-sized cards with five different themes that allow you to create randomized, generic stories. You can uh, set up yourself. I mean, it's basically the same as if you were to look at Shakespeare's plots uh, or Aristotle. Uh, even had a plot system, Blake Snyder's Save the Cat system if you're doing screenwriting. There's all these different systems that have come out that they basically use cards as well to tell you where the story beats are. And this should make it, if you follow the structure, um, doesn't have to necessarily be a Campbellian structure. If you did follow the Brett Blake Snyder beat sheet system, you would know what makes it cinematic, where the things should come in. Um, there are a few other systems where you can have A story, B story, C story, uh, things pop in and out and where to bring those about. Um, it can be a really good tool for people that are not used to the uh, format and skeleton of storytelling and it can make it a lot more fun for your players, a lot more fun for you, easier to prepare for you because you'll know what's coming next and what you can foreshadow and put together and all that kind of stuff. Then we have glow in the dark dice. Um, that's basically it. If you play in the dark, here you go. These ones have ghosts on them uh, for the high numbers. They're kind of cute. I have powders that make for glow in the dark stuff. If you wanted to add that to dice or whatever that you wanted, um, that make it kind of neat. I think, especially if you're going to play a Hollywood Halloween theme, and your terrain is all spooky and you have black lights set up and you're gonna play that way, then it makes sense. Otherwise, it's just difficult to read what you're working on. Um, maybe everybody's got their tablets out and they're using D&D &D Beyond or uh, some other application to make sure everything's uh, working and that's how you're playing through in the dark. But otherwise, eh, maybe you just like something there that glows when you turn the lights off. And then we have the most egregious example of why I brought it up so many times in this episode. Uh, first time creators asking for way too much money. They're asking for half a million dollars and it's probably because they licensed out World of Warcraft as um, the, the symbol. 
and uh, the minimum buy-in for these to get the core box of the various metal figures is 500 bucks. So do you have a thousand people with 500 bucks that are World of Warcraft fans that want to play? Maybe, because there's millions of fans, but for the most part, they're playing the video game, not necessarily tabletop games. It's hard to find that overlap. You get Yetis, Harpies, Kobolds, Murlocs, you get the Thralls, Velnin, Karen Bloodhoof, Sylvanas Windrunner, uh, Magni Bronzebeard, Kelbin, Mechatork, uh, all these different characters from the game. I have never played the game, but I'm just assuming from regular Warcraft that these folks are in there. They sound a little familiar. You get the Siege Towers and Thunder Bluffs and different keeps and different things. That's all cool. Here's the problem. It's a minimum buy-in of 500 bucks, and at least a thousand people need to do that. It's not the game that people are used to playing, so there needs to be something behind it specific to board gaming for this to make its its mark. I don't know. Hope. Good luck to them. And then we have another unfortunate one. This time they're in France, but they're using noble woods, as they say. So uh, the price of lumber in the United States is three, four hundred percent of what it should be. Um, they need to be able to spell the word burnt correctly, as you can see there in the right, especially since that's what, how the laser works. You would expect them to be able to double check their spelling, um, and they didn't. And that is not a very good indication of quality, even though the laser on this looks pretty neat. There is a company in San Diego that does custom dice and uh, wood dice and stuff like that themselves. Um, the, the way that this company is putting it out, they have, I think it customized per person, which means there's no economies of scale. So that can be kind of difficult. Um, the company in San Diego manages to have a small selection that they're able to produce rapidly. So no matter how cute these come out, it's just too much of an ask at that kind of price. The wood's being super expensive. Unless you're Wormwood, one of those other companies, it can be a pretty hard sell uh, to get you the purchase of this type of work. Um, good luck to them, like I said, but they need to come down on price of their minimum buy-in in order to figure out how much they could actually create, how many they can actually sell, and what the cost will really be. And myself, I'm feeling like a broken record rather than just a guy with a broken voice at this point. $144,000 for something you can pick up for three bucks at Harbor Freight is not a good idea. It is a good idea that they've created these labels uh, and put them on there and they should sell the STLs to do that. Um, but the injection molding to create these particular types of boxes is too much money to ask for something, like I say, that you can pick up for a couple bucks at Harbor Freight. Um, their initial prototypes might have even come from Harbor Freight. So here's the deal. They have separated out the dice so that you have uh, your attack, the damage, base damage, any adjust, uh, adjustments, different things like that, uh, the advantage, whatever it is, all set in there so you can just shake the box and it'll keep everything together. But you could also do this with just different colored dice. $144,000 for this is a pipe dream. <laughs> Make it so people can either print it off themselves, have a minimum of $100 or something, and just see what the market will really hold. Um, this is just business. This is not about your dream. This is just the business of bringing things to market. You got to look at what the market can hold. And none of these folks, I'd say this is one of the worst episodes we've had for people that their dreams was just too high. And maybe that's from coming out of the pandemic. Um, everybody thinks that they're going to make a new job or whatever the case is. That's fine, you know, everybody should be able to live their dream, except Bill Burr, who keeps circling my damn house with a damn helicopter. Live your dream in San Pedro or somewhere else. It's not my house. This is not the best place for you to fly around when I'm doing voiceovers on a Saturday. Uh, but other than that, like, I get it. There still is a market, though. There still is a minimum number of people that are required, and they're not doing the research and looking at what comp competing... Uh, campaigns have done and that bothers me but I hope that you have raised your expectations from all my complaining about what you would 
ask for on a Kickstarter or from anyone in any company, anywhere that's doing work and asking for your money. I work in quality control and it's a lifestyle I live by. And I would hope that more people do raise that bar of expectations. And that is something that uh, raises all ships, in my opinion, that we all demand people work hard, they follow through, and they don't half-ass things, that uh, there is a prescription for how to do things right. And you could watch Kitchen Nightmares with Gordon Ramsay telling people how to do it, or Restaurant Impossible, and that's a fun way to sit there in front of your TV and get those same business principles just fed to you. Um, but otherwise, you get this channel to tell you about it, and uh, I'm glad you guys are with me on it. Um, I'm hoping to get some RPG time, maybe some bites on various groups. I've been going to Reddit and other stuff like that. Maybe I can get a group myself. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things. It's, it's a long process. If you guys are out there having a hard time finding RPG time as well, or some people to play with, let me know. Put it out there. Maybe some people will be in your area, and they'll read the comments, and uh, you can have a wonderful time playing with people that uh, have similar interests to you. Thank you all very much. I hope you have a pleasant Father's Day, that you had a pleasant Juneteenth. It's almost over for here, but uh, you know it's a, an important day that we should have been celebrating this whole time as a big marker in this country to overcome one of our darkest periods. And uh, hopefully this will be uh, a new era of light and joy that people can celebrate. And uh, it's already when they started selling the fireworks. So more reason for people to celebrate, even though I feel bad for the dogs. You guys have a good one, and I'll catch you next time.